Hey there, welcome to this episode of The Cutting Room Floor. Uh, this is a segment where we dig a little bit deeper into uh, the text that we recently looked at here for the message at Sunny Slope. And because this past Sunday was Easter Sunday, we were focused on the story of Christ's resurrection. And we looked at the story as Mark records it in his gospel in Mark chapter 16. If you were um, in our service on Sunday, and if you if you were following along, and um, you you would have noticed that actually there's something unusual about Mark's gospel, and I want to just pull this up on the screen here. Here's Mark chapter sixteen, but you'll notice we ended our text on Sunday. We ended it right here. We ended it with verse eight, but there's this portion here, this little note that just about every Bible will have that indicates that Mark. there are other copies or there are other translations of the Bible that include a longer ending to the gospel. But there's a note here that says some of the earliest manuscripts don't include it, and that's a way of saying that there are some translations and some versions of the Bible that include this section, and there are some that don't. And so the question that we're faced with is, uh, is number one, what do we do with this longer ending of Mark? If you uh, if you follow along, and if you read along through the, the text, you'll read that the longer ending of Mark includes a number of rather unusual um, um, stories, or rather unusual portions of the text. Most notably is this portion here in chapter 16, verse 17, where it talks about in my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. So using this Bible uh, verse and using this passage, there are certain churches, in, particularly in the Appalachian region of the United States, where entire churches have been really built around this verse. And so during the worship services there, they actually handle serpents, and they do that as a sign of their faith. And that's based entirely on this one text here, uh, the handling serpents with their hands. One of the questions that we ought to ask ourselves is, is this passage, does it legitimately belong in our New Testament? Does it legitimately belong in our Bible? And that's the question that I really want to address with you, because if the, there's, there's sort of related questions that begin to creep in, if there are passages in the Bible that are sort of questionable, that maybe they belong, maybe they don't belong, um, does that mean that there are other verses and other chapters and other books of the Bible that may be just as unreliable? And it's sort of like a house of cards. Once you start to pull one out, does the whole tower, the whole... Um, the whole tower of cards begin to, there's a whole house of cards begin to kind of fall down on itself. That's that's sort of the question. So it's an important question to ask. And to answer that, what I want to do, I actually want to bring up um, something else here. I want to um, show you a copy of the what the Greek New Testament actually looks like. I'm going to put this up on the screen. And you can actually see, we're going to zoom in just a little bit here. Um, what you're looking at is a copy of the Gospel of Mark. Maybe you can make out right here where, it, you know, where you can sort of see the word Mark there. And it's Mark chapter 16, verses 2 through 8. And all of this, here's how this works. All of this here is the Greek text of Matthew of Mark chapter 16 verses 1 through 8. And it gives you all the, the, the Greek words without really a lot of extra stuff involved. Now if we go a little bit lower, this is what I want to this is what I really want you to focus on. This is a little bit like, looking under the hood, you may not understand a lot of the technical details here, but I can give you some of the basics that will help you at least have a general sense of how biblical 
scholars translate a text from one language into the other and how they come to the conclusions that they come to in terms of what belongs in the text and what does it there's a real there's a real science to all of this this is not uh this is not done in a random way it's not done in a way that um is sort of haphazard or guessing or just doing our best there's there's a real um there's a real science behind all of this and that's what i want to show you so this all of this down here is what is known as the as the textual apparatus and the textual apparatus what this really is 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 these are detailed notes that uh that are meant for the reader to explain how the translators uh, what what various manuscripts they used when coming to their conclusions about what belongs in the text and what doesn't. So um, you'll notice here, this is a footnote to verse 8. Verse 8 is the last verse of Mark's gospel. And there's a footnote to verse 8, and the first footnote says this omit verses 9 through 20. You can see that right here. And what they actually do is they give that, you can see here, they give that a rating of A. And what that means is that when they have gone through all the evidence, and when they have looked at all the ancient manuscripts, and they've compared them and studied them, they are pretty confident that the earliest manuscripts would have omitted verses 9 through 20. So they give that what they actually, they just assign it a rating, usually A, B, or C. And that, that helps us see their conclusion. How confident are they in the reading of this text? And in this case, they're pretty confident that verses 9 through 20 were not original to Mark's gospel. Now, that does not mean that there's not benefit in it. It doesn't even really mean that Mark, uh, that that this, that that longer ending of Mark wasn't somehow used in the early church. It just means that when comparing all the ancient manuscripts, the translators feel pretty strongly that it wasn't original to Mark. Now, the question is, well, what, how did they come to that conclusion? And the way that translators do this is they there there's a whole lot of different things that they do. They compare all the manuscripts that we have available to us of of the copies of the gospel, in this case, the Gospel of Mark. Now, there are oh, around the world, there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of copies of Mark's gospel, but not not necessarily copies of the entire gospel there might be a little page here or there sometimes it's even just a tiny little fragment of mark's gospel and so what the scholars end up doing is they look at all the fragments and they look at all the the complete copies of mark and they look at all the partial copies of mark and they begin to compare and there's a number of rules that they use to come to their conclusion so for example the older a manuscript is the more weight that the translators will give to it because they assume that it's been around for a longer period of time. And it's more likely that a change was made later on than earlier. And so the older a manuscript is, the more likely it is to be authentic. Um, the other thing that they look at is geographical range. In other words, there are some manuscripts that are more limited to a particular range. So it might, you know, there might be a certain um, family of manuscripts that are only found, let's say, in North Africa. And but but and and if they if they look at all those manuscripts, they might see that all those manuscripts are pretty similar. But when they compare them with manuscripts and fragments and textual uh, pieces, parchments, and things from all other places around the world, and they find that no other place really has that particular phrase or chapter or section, then, then they'll look at the broader manuscript as having more authority. They're, they'll look at that one as being at, at, um, as, as more likely to be authentic, because it seems most likely that um, 
the 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 manuscripts in one region were maybe altered and then as they were copied and spread through that region the the changes were were kept but it didn't wasn't spread very wide around the world and so they compared and they say well all these manuscripts here in north africa they all read one way but every other manuscript from around the world reads a different way it's more likely that the manuscript from all the other parts of the world are accurate and authentic there are other rules like that, but that just gives you a sense of how they do this. Now, here's I, I want to show you something else in how they do this. So, as I said, there are all these manuscripts. Sometimes the manuscripts that they're looking at are tiny little fragments. They're like no bigger than the size, you know, of a piece of paper like this. And they can read on those and they can see little portions of Mark. Sometimes they have an entire um, an entire copy of the Bible. Uh, or I, in this case, I should say the New Testament. So then they have very extensive. Um, all of these things here. So back on our on our page here, like, let me just show you this here. You can see that little symbol there. You can see all these letters here. Those are references to particular um, manuscripts. So uh, each, each letter, e uh, let me say it this way, each, each ancient manuscript is assigned a letter. And some of those manuscripts are known to have are to be more credible than others. And so there are some that when you see, so for example, here, um, for example, I'll just go here when it, omitting verses nine through 20, this little symbol here is the Hebrew letter Aleph. And that's a reference to, I believe it's the, it's called the Codex, uh, City Sinaiticus, I believe that's what it is. Um, it's either Sinaiticus or Vaticanus. Two very early manuscripts. They're uh, bound copies of almost the entire New Testament. And um, this this one here, the uh, is is known to be a very good manuscript. It's old. It's very reputable. It's very authoritative. And so that what this says here is um, this manuscript omits verses 9 through 20, as does this one, this one, this one. All these other little manuscripts and references omit verses 9 through 20. And that leads to then the conclusion that, that, that gives a lot of support anyways to the conclusion that the, the longer ending of Mark is probably not authentic to Mark's writing. It was probably added later on because all these other very old manuscripts and by the way, it also includes, let me show you something else here. I mentioned that geographical um, uh, quality. So here you have Syriac, uh, Coptic, Armenian, and so on. All these different um, reference uh, places all spread throughout the world all have, uh, all omit that longer ending. Um, there's There's other things as well. So we have Jerome. We have um, Epiphanus, all these other names. Um, there's a few other little tiny manuscripts here and footnotes and things. Um, all of the, what that's a way of saying is that when, when some of these early church fathers like Jerome referenced the gospel of Mark, they referenced it without that longer ending. And so that's a way of saying that even the early church fathers did not include that longer ending of Mark. And so if the church fathers didn't include it, that means that their Bible didn't likely have it, and therefore it was probably added later on. Now, there's a couple of other little things here. There's there's some variations. So some versions have uh, the longer ending, but they have a note attached to it, similar to our note. Um, others have a longer addition. And then these are all the manuscripts with, with the longer edition that are listed. Now, you can see there's a lot of them, but a lot of those ones are very small little fragments. And so they're, and they're much later on, and so they're less likely to be authoritative. Um, and again, longer ending, there's a number of, of references here. Ambrose, Augustine, uh, Nestorius. So those are all church fathers that include the longer ending or include it with a footnote. But again, those are references, those came several hundred years after the Gospel of Mark would have been written. And so that leads then to the conclusion that including, that adding it with a longer ending um, 
maybe is not the most likely way uh, likely way to go. So what does all of that mean? There's a couple of things that I think are worth taking away. The first thing is this. Your Bible is actually very, very trustworthy. Yes, it's true that there are a lot of, you know, if you if you go through, you can see in, in a Greek New Testament, you can find a lot of places where there are footnotes and little differences. But 99 times out of 100, those, those textual differences are very uh, small, and they really don't alter the main meaning of a text. There's only a couple of places in the New Testament where the difference is quite significant. Um, and that would be Mark chapter 16 here, the, the text that we're looking at, and then also John chapter 7, verse 53 to 8, verse 12, the story of the woman caught in adultery. That's an that's an example where probably the text was was likely not included in the earliest uh, copies of the manuscript. Uh, now, does that does that mean so? So my my point in saying that is that the you, you know most of the time the textual variants are pretty insignificant. But my other point is that the amount of study and research and care that goes into verifying and checking and double checking what did the text actually say is is a remarkable science and it's it's one that is undertaken with a great deal of care and concern for getting the best and most reliable copy of scripture that we possibly can get um, you can see the amount of time that is devoted to this and so when you read your bible and you come to these places where it seems like maybe there should be a Maybe there's a variant and you ask yourself, well, can I really trust my Bible? The answer is almost always, well, not almost. The answer is yes, you can. Yes, you can. There, are, Yes, while there, it's true there are certain places where there are tiny variants and things, the main message is, is consistent all the way through. And so your Bible is absolutely trustworthy. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And we will see you next time on the cutting room floor.